G'day, fellas, and welcome to the Byzantines Overexplained. We have to overexplain them because you just cannot explain this civilization simply. There is so much going on with this civ. Let's dive into it. I'm going to make sure that you have got access to my spreadsheet. I'll be running you through this spreadsheet as we go through. Uh, to start off, we're going to queue four villages in our town center like we do with all civs. Two vills to gold, two vills to wood, two vills to berries. So let's begin with that build order. So it is something similar to what you would have seen with the English back in season one. Players were loving this. Now we're going to start off, take a look at this. We're building four buildings and every single one of these buildings have an intentional placement. So I'm, I'm just going to pause it right now. Okay, so we've got four buildings down, very intentional. Two vills to wood, two vills to gold, two vills to, to berries. What the hell's going on here? So starting off, we've got assistant. If you don't know what assistant is, that's okay. Make sure you go and check out the previous videos I've done for the Byzantines. They will explain the mechanics so that you are up to date with it. If you haven't watched any previous Byzantine content, you need to go outside and, and <laughs> touch grass and then come back in and then watch all the Byzantine content, then do this. Otherwise, you're just not going to get it. So number one, the cistern. We want the cistern. Actually, you know what? We'll start with a mill. The mill. M normally, you'd think that the mill would be placed around this area. The reason it's not is because we want the mill to be touching as many berry bushes as possible. Playing the Byzantines in Season 6, you're going to be needing to get access to mercenaries really quickly. So the more berry bushes that you consume early on, the faster you have olive oil, and therefore the sooner you can get your mercenaries. So that's why we place the mill in this position where it has immediate adjacency to these three berry bushes. The cistern needs to be very close to the mill because it needs to be boosting up the mill because we're going to be going for an early wheelbarrow. However, ideally, we still want it to be able to be in range of the town center for its AOE for the villagers. And if we can get the gold, we'll take it. And in this case, we definitely do. When it comes to the house over here on the outside of the gold mine, this is placed down because we're going to be looking to get border settlements, which is an upgrade that increases your line of sight uh, for your houses also makes them uh, train much faster or construct much faster. And we're building that on the outside so that if there are any raids that come in by the enemy, we'll be able to see them before they can see us. And then finally, the mining camp. We want our villagers as close to the town center as we possibly can get them. And that's why we put the mining camp in this position. So every single one of these buildings has a very specific reason why it's there. Let's continue. So we're starting off and we're going to queue one villager or uh, send one villager out to gold. This is because we want to get that early wheelbarrow. So we need to get to 150 gold. And you, if you do it, you're going to be slightly faster if you've got three vills versus two. And it just works out that, better that way. We're also going to make sure that, as you just saw then, we switched our mill uh, to Dialectus. And Dialectus is not a uh, an STD. It is actually a technology or <laughs> something that you can use to increase the speed at which your technologies uh, research. So you can see at the moment, what we're going to be doing is looking to move our villages. So uh, I'll, I'll just slow it down a little bit. Um, we're looking to move our villages from wood over onto berries. And the reason why is because we only need 50 wood. Now, if you've done this build order before with the English, you start with an extra 50 wood, so it's fine. Whereas here, we need to actually gather that 50 wood, and that's why we're doing that here. So... Uh, you can see that we're waiting for... I, I, ideally, I want to see fives on both of my villages, and then I'll transfer the villages off. So you can see that we're, we're going through it here slowly. And now we're going to rally out to berries. So, so far, we've rallied one to gold to start with, and then we rallied to berries, and now we're going to rally another one vill to berries. So we want a total of six vills on berries. And this is really important because this will give us the optimal amount uh, of, of olive oil right when we need it. Now you can see I'm highlighting the timer once again. So we're researching wheelbarrow at one minute and five seconds and we're switching the system to Dialectus. That way it's going to research 30 seconds faster. Instead of researching in 90 seconds, your wheelbarrow is going to be coming out in 60 seconds, which is pretty damn fancy, I might say. So now we enter the down phase. The, the, the first minute of the Byzantines is incredibly complex. The next two minutes, super duper easy. All you're going to do is just rally the sheep. Speaking of sheep, you can see that my scout has gone for a really aggressive pathway right here. You can see me typing ZZZ in the chat just because there's not really much to do at this point. Um, so the reason we can do this is because we're on berries early. So our starting sheep, we've only just gone onto them, which means that we're not going to run out of them anytime soon. So because of that, our scout can be out and about having fun all night and only needs to come home right before 6am when they need to start work. And that's what you love to see. So uh, at this point, um, everything's gone pretty, pretty steady, pretty well. Um, 
I, I don't really know what to talk about here because as, as I mentioned before, uh, we, we are in a down period. We've got six vills going out to sheep. Uh, I guess one thing that we can mention is just our landmark. Um, so with regard to the landmark, so there's two landmarks for the Byzantines, the Grand Winery, uh, which is normally something that you'd put on your berries. And then you've got the, uh, the Hippodrome, uh, the Imperial Hippodrome, which is the Cavalry Landmark. Now, initially, I thought that the best landmark would be uh, the, gr the Grand Winery. But when I ran the numbers... It just doesn't stack up. I can't find a, a way to make it work other than going for 2TC and playing very, very passive for the first 20 minutes of the game. I just can't see it working. And that the only time that that's going to work is, is pretty much never in this meta because the, the recent changes to the town center mean that it's almost impossible to pull off a, a, a straight 2TC uh, in, in, in the early game, at least at this stage. Look, as the meta develops, we'll see how it goes, but I, I suspect we're going to be having a very greedy meta uh, for the beginning of Season 6. So, now you can see that I am up to the stage where we are constructing our Hippodrome, so I'll pause it for you guys. So we're rallying six vills out to sheep, and then we're going to be constructing our Imperial Hippodrome at 310. Uh, and once again, I'll, I'll be leaving a screenshot, or I'll be leaving a link in the description to where you can access this uh, for it or for, for yourself. So I'm now going to prepare my five bills, cash in and drop down that Hippodrome. I want to make sure that when I'm placing my Hippodrome down, that it's inside the radius of the system. You can see right here, the influence uh, zone of the system. And another thing to note is that we don't want this crossing the system. What do I mean by that? So think of your system, uh, think of the central lines as something that you don't want to cross. And I know that's kind of weird, but uh, let me explain. It, when you have, whenever you come and put in your next cisterns, what you're going to be doing is drawing an aqueduct between them. If you put this bad boy right next to your cistern, you're going to have to draw an aqueduct all the way around it. And it's just going to be extra stone. And you don't want to have to pay for that stone. You can, but you don't want to. That's why. So we unpause it. We continue. And now we move vills over onto wood. So you can see right here, we're going to s switch one vill from sheep to wood. One vill from berries to wood, and then we're going to rally our TC to wood. So now we've got three vills on wood. And once again, we enter into a stage of the game where we are fortunately just, just going to chill out for a little bit. But that's okay, because it's a, it's about to get really hectic when we're closer to age up. So we've done a pretty decent job here gathering up the sheep. Not a, not a bad amount of sheep. Remember, we start with three. There's 24 in the map. So if you can get 12, you're doing well. And it looks like we've probably got about 10 there, so not too bad at all. And... At this stage, what we're working towards, so we've we've gotten our wheelbarrow early on. Now we're looking to get our double broad axe and our horticulture upgrades, and we want to get them early on. But at the same time, we still need to get units out, and that's where our olive oil comes in. So let's keep on watching, keep on going. Um, so right before you age up, technically like right after you age up, there are so many things that you need to do. It feels like you're playing the Delhi Sultanate. You know when you're playing the Delhi Sultanate and you, you have to click all the upgrades and you, you got to make sure that you don't forget any of them? It's the exact same thing here with the Byzantines, except there are just so many other little things to do that are much harder uh, than upgrades. So there we go, dropping a house down when we've got 50 wood. And now I'm going to be setting up a lumber camp over on my wood line, just making sure I pop a villager through. Lovely town bell for us. And dropping down that lumber camp. So we're going to pause it right here. You can see I, I accidentally put a five in. Um, so we have uh, made one house with a goldville. We're making a lumber camp with a woodville. Let's have a look at the things that we need to do when we age up. So we're going to be aging up in, oh gosh, 15 seconds. So we need to do, we need to take our five vills from our hippodrome and we're going to move them over to wood. Then we're going to research horticulture and double broadaxe at the same time, hopefully. And then we're going to rally our TC to wood permanently. And then we're going to take three vills from gold put them onto wood, and then we're going to take five vills from berries and put them onto sheep. And all of that happens within the space of about 30 seconds. Sometimes it can happen with less than that. And that th there there is a very specific reason why, why we're doing all of this, and I, I will get into it uh, at the end of the video. We, we'll talk about the reasons as to why we're doing uh, the, the overarching uh, strategy here. So the age up comes through, double broad axe is clicked, horticulture is clicked immediately, and now we're making sure that we're on uh, dialectus here training up our villagers. And now we're going to drop off our gold once we've got 50. There we go, 55. And now we're going to drop off our uh, our olive oil once we've got at least 500. Wonderful, there we go. Now we want to make sure that we don't pick up border settlements until after we drop our mercenary house. That's really important because border settlements does cost 25 wood. That's the upgrade at the houses uh, to increase the line of sight. And now what we're doing is we're looking to drop down our mercenary uh, house. And we want to always do this in the AOE of our system. 
or the, or the radius, the, uh, the influence of our system. That's really, really important. So dropping it down with five villagers. These five villagers, uh, once they are finished here, they're going to head over onto food. And we're going to make sure that we balance out our economy. So I think I, I've, I, I've done a little bit of a mistake here. So I think technically in the build order, we're meant to take the three vills from gold and put them onto wood. Uh, but I ac accidentally put them on, onto sheep, which is okay. As long as you balance it up, that's the most important thing. Uh, you want you want to be at 12, 12. That, that's the best way to remember it. So uh, you, you want to have 12 vills on food, 12 vills on wood, and then be rallied out to wood. That, that's pretty much it. So we're going to drop down our, uh, our archery range now that we have border uh, settlements on the range and you're going to see our line of sight go out. Oh, never mind. You can look on the minimap right here. Boom. It is huge how, how much uh, it, extra it provides. Horsemen now thrown in queue as well. And what we're going to be looking to do is we're getting out Keshix. We're getting out our horsemen. And with this, we're going we're gonna to use these two units uh, to really leverage the power of our landmark because of its unique ability triumph triumph is an ability that i haven't really covered on the channel here just simply because I, I think it's overpowered i'm i'm surprised that it's this strong and they haven't nerfed it but we'll we'll have to see i, I reckon it's probably going to cop a nerf early on uh, in season six though it just seems way too strong uh, but anyway let's let's keep on moving keep on focusing one of the other great things about having border settlements is they build really quickly uh so you can see that our, our houses whenever they go up they'll go up in three seconds i think it works out to be so it's a really nice upgrade to have. So you can, if, you, you never really get housed when you've got it. So uh, we're now training. So the idea is that we want to be spamming out uh, as, as much as we can. Archers, horsemen, uh, pretty much nonstop. And one of the things that's really helping us with this is the system. Remember that the bonus for the system increases the amount of military uh, production speed you've got by 20%. I, I also just forgot to mention, we want to make sure that we switch our assistant back to the military one uh, once we've gotten our horticulture double broadaxe upgrade. Yeah, there's a, there's a fair bit in here. And now we're looking to expand. So the reason why we're now looking to take our stone and we'll also go back onto gold is because now that we have got our units out, we can fend off any, any attack that may have been here. Maybe there was a Mongol attack or maybe there's an Ottoman attack or maybe an English attack. So we're now able to, to retake control of the map. Um, and I will just say, with, with regard to this build order, your mileage may vary depending on the civilization that you're up against. You know, if, if, if you're up against an English Civ and they rush you with men at arms, we're obviously not going to be able to follow this build order to a T. So I should have said that caveat at the beginning. I'm, I didn't. Now I'm saying it 12 minutes through. So hopefully you made it this long before you made the comment, well, Jongo, this isn't going to work against a, a men at arm rush. Well, obviously, John, it's not designed to work against a men at arm rush. The idea would be that you're playing in a vacuum. Not really, but you, you get the picture. Anyway, we've, we're now expanding, and one, one of the things that we're doing is putting that house down on the other side of the um, of, of the stone outcropping so that we have more line of sight. And now we're looking to place our cistern down. Now, one of the things that you'll see that I do is I align the cistern so that the influences are the same. And what this does is it makes it very easy to connect the aqueduct across the center like this. Uh, and you'll see when I place it down here, so I'll just simply connect it i had a little bit of a little bit of trouble right here uh now i had to cancel it and now I, i'm in, in a bit of a problem because you can see that there's a, a a few little um a little uh what are they called like ghosts in here and i'm trying to get i'm trying to snap it to the point in the middle and you can see i'm moving over the top of it i'm like oh why won't you snap to the middle and then i realized oh wait that's why uh, there, there's ghost bridges in there ghost aqueducts uh, I think I, I eventually realize it, but yeah, lost lost a fair bit of uh, APM there trying to work out exactly what was going on uh, when I canceled it. So I, I think that there's, it's kind of like walls, how there's different segments of the walls. I, I still haven't figured it out there. I think I just realized there, uh, but yeah, I didn't, I don't think it cost us too much time, uh, and, but that's essentially what you want to be doing uh, and just make sure that you, you hit it from center to center. It makes it much easier as you can see. So now our numbers are starting to build up, and this is where we're going to add in a barracks. Now, keep in mind, the Byzantines have got access to a unique uh, barracks unit. In fact, they've got access to two. Uh, but the one that we're going to be playing with here is going to be the Limitani. Limitani, incredibly strong unit uh, in the feudal age. And as a result, we're only ever going to be staying on one archery range. We're just going to be using that one archery range to spam archers. We're not going to go into two or three, and we're going to leverage the power of the Limitani. But now we continue spamming out our systems here. And one of the other things that you'll note is that we're always going to the center. Uh, I'm actually running a little bit short here on stone. Uh, so I'm, if I remember correctly, we're, we're going to look to try and uh, build a house because it'll give us a little bit of extra stone. Actually, no, never mind. I remembered incorrectly. Uh, you can you can use that mechanic though. If, if, if you're a little bit short on stone, you can just build a house and you, you'll have eight stone within three seconds. So that's a nice little, nice little trick that you can do. So now that we've got three systems up, 
what that means is we've got a 15% eco bonus to all of our villagers. And we also it also means that we've got a 60% bonus to our military production. So instead of that being one archery range, that's like 1.6 archery ranges. Instead of one barracks, 1.6 barracks. So it's, it's a pretty decent amount of production that we've got here, even though it's only the four buildings, including the... Well, I guess technically it's three. Uh, I mean, technically it's four, but actually it's three because the... Uh, the uh, mercenary, the, I was going to call it the mercenary stable. The mercenary house doesn't really count at the moment. We've, we've only made two Kashyyyks from it, but we'll continue making Kashyyyks. And just keep in mind, the idea is that you, you would actually be playing uh, with your units at this point. You, I'm, I'm just kind of massing them up and showing you what the macro looks like and as to why it's so complex. Keep in mind, I'm a Conqueror 3 player and I am... I'm really struggling with this civilization. I actually messaged a couple of people and I, and I said, I've never wanted auto hotkeys more than what I have, what than playing with the Byzantines. It is just crazy because you have so many units coming out just really, really quickly and they're different types of units, right? Like you're making archers, you're making horsemen, you're making uh, Limitani, you're making Kashyyyks and this is just in the, in the feudal age. So th there's a lot of units that are coming out and because they come out so fast and you're, you're not making them in batches, you're making them just one, 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 one. They're always trickling in one, 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 one. It just, it, you, you find yourself always losing like a, a straggler here or there. Uh, and so that, that can be really quite tough. Uh, but at this point in, we're 10 minutes through and you can see the general idea. The general idea is that we stay on one base, we pick up our eco upgrades as early as we possibly can. We picked up our wheelbarrow as soon as we could. We picked up our double broadaxe, our horticulture as soon as we could. And we don't die. That's the number one thing. Number two is we look to try and get mercenaries early. We've only picked up enough olive oil. Now, keep in mind, you only get olive oil from berries and olive groves uh, in on dry Arabia. There, you get it from fish as well, but we obviously don't have fish here. Um, and we, we just get 500 olive oil because that's all, all we need. We need the 100 to sign the contract and then we need 400 uh, to buy the first round of Keshiks, and then we're immediately off the berries because the berries are a slower gather rate than sheep. So we mo move to sheep immediately after that. And then once we've once we've done that, then we're looking to try and get those units on the field. We get our Keshiks on the field, we start our archer mass, and then we are working towards our horsemen. And one of the great things about playing, um, when, when we're playing this composition, so horsemen uh, together with archers, is you can't really mess up the macro because if you've got too much wood you just make more archers. And if you got too much food, you just make more horsemen. So it's really simple. As long as you're keeping your resources relatively low, you can see at the moment, I've got less than, what is it, about 300 resources in the bank. Well, maybe, actually, when you include the olive oil, it's a little bit more. Uh, but we're always keeping our resources really low here, making sure that we're not stacking up units like crazy uh, or stacking up our numbers like crazy and making sure that we're just always training things. It's, it's really important to always be training things. Try not to get distracted with the macro like this. So... The next goal after that is getting our system level to system level 5. Once we get to system level 5, what that's going to do is push our gather rate bonus up to 25%. So that's on top of your standard bonuses, you know, your horticultures, your double broad axes. So in total, we're getting an extra 40% gather rate. That's a pretty decent bonus. We're, we're basically getting an extra, you know, 25% villagers over your enemy. That's a decent amount, especially early on. Because we want to avoid going for a second TC early on, just simply because TCs are not as strong as they used to be. And it means that you're going to be subject to extra scrutiny if you try and do that. Once you've secured the five systems, though, and you can see that we've got a pretty decent number of units out on the field. We picked up our blacksmith upgrades at this point. Now we can start to think about dropping a second TC. And you can see our stone is getting to that point. Now, if you lose a system, I will just say that when it comes to the price of systems down here, they increase with each system you make. So the first one you get for 50 stone. Second one, 100. Third one, 150. You get the picture. The problem is when you've got a level five cistern and aqueduct network, if you lose a cistern, you have to replace that cistern at full price. That's 250 stone. That's a lot. So keep that in mind that if you are playing a build order like this, it might be a good idea to try and keep everything compartmentalized, keep it nice and, and at home. Uh, and because you can see right here, as an example, if the enemy was to come out here and just it, torch this down, I'd be in a really bad spot because now I'm down 300 stone. Keep that in mind. But they haven't done that because we're playing against the easy AI. So naturally, I'm just going to use this as an opportunity to take our second town center. So that's what we'll do and make it sure that we move out onto deer. The other thing that we're always doing is prioritizing berries. We want to make sure that we gather our berries as the first thing 
out on the map and you can see i've got a couple of berries back here in the base and i've kind of realized i've been like oh that's right i have berries in the back of my base i might i might, uh, I might do that uh, but we're out on the map and we're actually taking our own berries. I have tested with taking the enemy's berries. I just wouldn't recommend it. Didn't go well for me. Don't do it. Uh, just just try and get your own berries. That, that That's it. I mean, it, maybe if you're playing Lippany, then you can try and do a sneaky berry thing. But it, it's hard. It, it's, maybe if you're against an English player, you could probably get away with it. But I would recommend just just go, go with your own berries early on. So anyway, uh, let's, let's keep moving on and moving forward. We're making sure that we're training our units, keeping them up. Uh, we're also working towards uh, gathering that stone. You can see we've kept three vills on stone the entire time. Once again, it's about rebuilding the aqueduct network or the cisterns. Or if you're lucky, going for a third TC because you've definitely got the production to do it. Even though we, we've only got a handful of production facilities here, remember that we are effectively double what uh, a normal civilization would be. Just simply because we have an extra 100% military production. A spearman takes 15 seconds, not with this civilization, it takes 7 seconds to build. Well, technically it doesn't because they don't have spearmen, because it's they've got the unique limited eye, but you get the point. It, it is twice as fast to build those military uh, buildings, or rather military units. Um, and, uh, and yeah, that's essentially it. So we're almost 15 minutes through, we picked up every single upgrade that you could ask for, and we can still, we can look to make units, we can go for a push, we can do whatever we want here. Uh, but you, you see the gen general outline of the way the civilization is played. Now let's talk about why the civilization is played this way. Uh, so one of the big things that happened in, uh, in in this patch is the change to town centers. So essentially what happened was your first town center, it's still exactly the same as a as a normal TC. Um, it, it's got eight range. It can hold a lot of people inside of it. Um, and it's, it's super duper strong. What happened was for season six, they nerfed town centers so that they have got less range. Uh, let me throw in a couple of these. So if we take a look at the new TC, the town center now has got, let's pop inside, three less capacity, and we've got two less range. It actually means that a longbow can stand outside the radius of this town center, and it won't be hit. And because of that, that single change, what you're going to see is a lot of players acknowledging that point and potentially overestimating how big of a nerf that is. And what that's going to do is that's going to drive a lot of people to avoid playing two TCs. You're, sh you're still going to see people go for it, but you're going to see a lot more aggression because of it. Because naturally when people see something nerfed, they think, oh, it's terrible. There could be a unit with a million damage. And if they nerf it to 900,000 damage, 999,999, Everyone would be like, I, I'd be up there with the thumbnail. Be like, oh, it finally got nerfed. Still absolutely broken. Uh, I'm not saying that 2TC is going to be absolutely broken. Uh, I, I definitely don't think that's the case. I think 100% uh, 1TC is going to be the meta early on in the season until people work it out. Um, and that that's essentially why um, I think that people, or why as the Byzantines, it doesn't make sense to go into, into um, a second TC, at least early on. It's definitely okay to go into it once you've uh, won a fight or you've secured ground um, or you've got all your systems up because then your economy is going to be quite good as well. So you can kind of afford to support your, uh, your eco back home and the front line. Let's talk about the next thing, which is our landmark. Now I'm going to be diving into a, uh, a much greater analysis of this landmark, but essentially here's what you need to know. The Grand Winery is absolutely trash. It is a terrible landmark. Let's just break it down. So why is it trash? So when you place the Grand Winery down, let's just do our cheats. So when you place this landmark down, you can see the, the AOE around it or the area of influence around it. It's not that big. It works out to be 12 farms on the inner ring and then on the outer ring, it's 20 farms, but technically four of them are on the corners and they don't get influenced. Uh, so it works out to be 28 farms. Now... In, inside these berry bushes, there is 1,500 food. And that works out to be 750 olive oil. So if we take a look at our olive oil, you'll see that 50% of olive oil is gathered from berry bushes, whereas it's only 20% from olive groves. So now that we know that, we know that out of this 1,500, we're going to get 750 olive oil. What can we do with that olive oil? Well, if it, let's, let's just place the Grand Winery down just to start with. And I'll put down on in a jiffy. So, number one is when we sign up for our mercenaries, we know that that's going to cost 100. So we, we need to spend that 100 in the first place. 
So we're, let's just do... We'll do Kashyyyk. No, uh, let's do Kashyyyk. I, I think Kashyyyk's are the best. Uh, not with this lane mark, though. Um, <laughs> so now that we've spent that, how much do we have over here? Well, this landmark... We, well, we know this, this is 750. Now, 750 is enough to buy one set of Kashyx. If we take a look at the Grand Winery, it gives 60% olive oil on top of, of what you're getting. So that 750 goes to 1,200 olive oil. That's a decent amount. And it's a nice boost to the early game because it means instead of getting one set of Kashyx, you can actually get three sets of Kashyx. That's pretty big. The problem is... This landmark only offers about that much. And I know you might be saying, but Drongo, it clearly says an extra 60% olive oil for olive groves. And that's a really good point. Except it's 60% of the base rate, not an extra 60% on top of the base rate. Let me explain. When you're on a farm and you're collect you're out here, let me turn off in a jiffy. You're out here collecting your collecting your olives having a good time. Let's make it so that they... Uh, you know what? Well, th this is fine. Uh, you're out here collecting your your food. You occasionally get some olives. Now, if we go back here to the tech tree, you can see that olive oil, 20% from olive groves. So you can assume that this guy, he's going to collect two olive oil after collecting his 10 food. Let's take a look. Wonderful. Now he's going to drop it off. So now let's have a look at what the Grand Winery says. The Grand Winery says that it gives... Or nearby villagers gather 60%, plus 60% olive oil from berry bushes and olive groves. So naturally, you would think that that 20... Because remember, before we had the 20%, you'd think that would go from 20% to 80%. At least that's what I thought when I first read it. I was like, okay, that, that's quite simple. But it's not. It goes from 20% to 31%, 32%. Have a look how much this bill drops off. Three olive oil. Yay, three olive oil. And this guy dropped off two. You get my point, right? It's literally Buckley's. Like the difference is absolutely terrible. And I, I know that there's people that are going to say, oh, but look, Drongo, you've got 28 farms that are all going to be getting the bonus. So over the course of a 30 minute game, you're going to make... At the 26 minute mark, you'll make 200 olive oil a minute more by having this landmark. And not to mention, it also acts as a uh, as a monastery. It's like, oh, okay, it acts as a monastery. Right, like, okay, sure, those are bonuses. But then you compare it to this bad boy, which is just absolutely absurd. Acts as a stable. Okay, so it can make cavalry. We get that. Contains the triumph ability that can be activated with supply points to increase cavalry melee damage, move speed, and health regen. There you go. So, it, it's a lot as well. So, if, if we were to train... Let's get... Actually, we can't because we've got this guy out. It's a huge amount. And the reason why I'm emphasizing it so much is because you can get greater synergy with it by going for Kashyyyk. Let me explain. Let's get our things back on. Our cheats back on. In a jiffy. So... We're going to start off with the Imperial Hippodrome. And we're going to put down our Mercenary House. Why not? And we're going to get ourselves a house as well because we've got a Mercenary House and we, we want it. So, when you've got Cavalry Units, doesn't matter the age. Feudal, Castle, Imperial. But we're just going to focus on Feudal, right? Because that's the most important at the moment. They've just changed the meta significantly to favor Feudal fights. That was a lot of Fs. I know. Alliteration. It's one of my strengths. Uh, why do I still... Does this not... Do I not get extra olive oil from you? From that cheat? That's... I feel like I've been cheated. Anyway, that, that's okay. We don't need it. We don't, we don't need it. So, with the Imperial Hippodrome, it's got a ticket system. The same ticket system that you will be familiar with from the Rus and the way that their militia works. Except you do start with extra... You start with a lot of tickets here or supply points. When you click this button, it's going to consume all of them. And depending on how many of those tickets you've got depends on how long the buff lasts. So that's the only thing it affects, the length of the buff. It doesn't affect the numbers that you see. So what does it do? It increases your damage by 25%, increases your movement speed by 10%, and your health regen by 2. So that means every second you're regening by 2, irrespective of if you're in battle or out of battle. 
Number two, your movement speed's faster, which means that if you pop this, your enemy's going to have a harder time running away from you, which they're going to want to do when they see it. And number three is extra damage, because why not? Who, who doesn't like extra damage? So if we take a look at it, uh, this is extra damage to your base uh, amount. It does not give you extra damage to your multiplier. So you, you don't get an extra two against siege or an extra two against ranged. It's just the base amount, but it's still a pretty hefty amount, as you can see here, an extra four damage. It's nothing to, to sniff at. Nothing to sniff at? Or you might want to sniff at it. I don't know. Do whatever you like with it. I'm just telling you, it's a lot. Now, because of that, we can subsequently go a little bit further. Let's see if we can actually get some olive oil out here. I'm, I'm just going to get a couple of villagers to help me gather this up because I like olive oil. Looks like we're getting quite a bit of olive oil out here. So we're going to go with our Kashyx. And uh, uh, another thing that I'm going to propose is that you should only ever be going... Uh, for the Kashyx. That, that's my proposal. I don't think you'll ever go for longbows. I don't think you'll ever go for the javelin throwers, which are in the other contracts. So if we take just a, a quick squiz at those contracts, because I did click in, you've got three contracts, Eastern, Western, and Silk Road contracts. They all offer, offer different things, um, but I would suggest that the Kashyx is the most powerful one. And you're, ne you're never going to make Gulams. You're never going to make Tower Elephants. You're just going to use it to make Kashyx. Let me explain why. It, and there's a, there's a lot to take in here, but... Let's get to it. So, the Keshik is a cool unit. Why is it a cool unit? Because it's got lifesteal. A heal after every attack. And keep in mind, the Keshik gets all of its unique upgrades every age that it goes through. So that means when it goes to Castle Age, yes, it gets the extra lifesteal. On top of that, now our Keshik not only has lifesteal, but it also has natural healing every second from Triumph. You can see right now that the Triumph has been on cooldown and we're about where we can click it right now if we want to. We've got three tickets, but that's only going to give us four and a half seconds. So it's not really worth using it. So I think ideally with when it comes to Triumph, you want to use it where you know you're going to get at least like 15 seconds out of it and you can have a really good fight with it. So now you've got amazing synergy because not only are you just making the occasional horseman, horseman, may, maybe make some archers as well, horseman, horseman. But on top of that, you're supplementing that with additional cavalry in the form of Keshix. On top of that, your Keshix are badass damage dealers, which do a, a, a lot of damage, which means that when you hit Triumph, they're getting more of a bonus as well. So another four damage right here. Uh, and on top of that, they've got that lifesteal. So they've got the lifesteal plus the healing. It is, it's just all of these beautiful little synergies that are coming through. And uh, it, it, it just works so incredibly well together when you focus around going into Keshix. And because of this, you can d focus the way that you play as well by starting off or opening uh, with archers. So it makes it very simple to macro for, as you saw in the beginning of the video. All I'm doing, I've just got, I've got wood and I've got food. Or wood and food and i'm just making horsemen and i'm making archers and then once i've got map control at least like half of the map i can move out get berries get more kashiks in another thing to note why kashiks are so good is just when it comes to I, I don't actually know what the term for this is but maybe somebody does let's say that you're fighting an enemy okay and you've got let's say you've got two kashiks and let's say that you've got three horsemen okay because that's a reasonable amount of units that you're gonna have in the early game and you're, you're fighting an enemy and early on in the game so let's say the first fight has got ju just your three horsemen this is this explains why the keshiks are so good horseman one dies horseman two dies horseman three dies the whole time that horseman one was alive horseman three was dealing damage the whole time that horseman two was alive horseman three was dealing damage and the whole time that horseman three was alive he was also dealing damage himself however when you have three horsemen and two Kashyyyks, now all of a sudden, you have horseman one who dies, horseman two who dies, and horseman three who dies. And now not only were horsemen one, two, and three all dealing damage their entire lives, but the two Kashyyyks were also dealing damage their entire lives as well. And then they have to die. And remember, they do a lot of damage. My point is that the we're, we're stacking more damage on top of something and then we're buffing it further and we're getting a really strong synergy through doing this so that's why i advocate at the moment uh, that this is the best route to go when it comes to your mercenaries when it comes to uh going for your early game as as i said like look i i think that the grand winery and uh, at first glance i thought this was a, a really really good landmark and you know it'll be simple i just play two tc byzantines and i wait to 15 minutes and then i just kill my enemy in castle age it's not the case here
uh, the grand, I think the grand winery is just not going to pay off uh, enough. And, and I know that there's going to be people that are, are like, okay, but Drongo, like you, you can just go for the other mercenary contract. So you, you can go for, hold on, uh, let me pull it up here. Uh, Drongo, you can just play, you can go to TC and go for the grand winery and just play the Western mercenary contract and then get, you know, lots of, lots of longbows. The issue there is that the longbows, you can only actually get two, um, two recruits of them. Whereas the Keshix, you can get three. The Keshix costs 400 each and you get 1200 from your berries with Grand Winery. Whereas the Longbowmans cost 480 uh, and you've got 1200 to play with. So you can only get two sets of them. So I don't think that that is a reasonable argument if you wanted to play defensive. I feel like if you were playing defensive as the Byzantines, it's only a matter of time until you get overwhelmed on that second TC. Because I don't think that there's a lot of defensive bonuses here with the exception of stuff that... I would say is niche. So what would I describe as niche? I would say that your system ability uh, to use uh, Presidium, I think that this is niche and probably something that'll be, it'll be good to have it, but you're not going to be relying on it with the exception of a, say a Castle Age Keep that is getting sieged down by uh, Trebs. Then you'll extend out Presidium to the Keep so that it can stay alive a little bit longer. Your repairs are a bit easier, that sort of thing. Uh, the other thing is uh, Acratoid Defenses. Um, and this is great. But if you if your enemy sees you doing this, they can very easily just run away from you or, or look to try and kite you because it doesn't give you an increase in movement speed. And then they'll just pick off the villagers because even though they've got slightly more armor, you, they're still going to be picked off because your enemy's going to have a decent number of archers. So I think that that's one of those things where it's like, compare that to say like the English bonus where your vills have got bows and you've got extra attack speed and you've got a council hall and you've got longbows with seven range and your town center fires extra arrows. I don't think the defensive... Um, aspect of this civilization is really there to justify playing into two TCs. But as I said, I, I think it is a natural progression that we will see players go into that. I just think at the moment, with the way the, way the meta is going to go, so many people are going to be trying it and they'll just be dying it and they'll go, okay, effort, I'm just going to do one TC. Uh, and that's pretty much it. Now, another thing that we haven't really touched on yet in, in this video, and I'll, I'll do it just a little bit, as to, as to why the Imperial Hippodrome is so good, it's because when you go to Castle Age, and you will go Castle Age, uh, you're going to put, be putting down... Now, you can choose. I'd, I'd actually recommend putting down the Golden Horde Tower. I think that this is genuinely a better landmark than the Cistern of the First Hill. If... And I know that this might sound counterintuitive. If you Fast Castle. Uh, if, if, you, or if you don't Fast Castle. If you Fast Castle, I think the Cistern of the First Hill is better. Because one of the things that people don't realize about the Cistern of the First Hill is that you've only got 10 active flasks. That's it. So you can't pop this on all of your units. It's just 10 units. So if you're thinking about like a big fight in Imperial Age and there's 40 units against 40 units, it might make a small difference. Whereas if it's 100 units versus 100 units, it's not going to make any difference at all. Barely any difference at all. If it's a cast, a fast castle that is going to be making the... or If, if you're going to be doing a fast castle, it's going to be significantly more effective because this is a static bonus, right? 25 per, uh, per second, 25 health per second for 10 seconds. So if you've got a Varangian Guard... Uh, you're going to be healing that up, bad boy up from zero to full. Uh, if you And you can just click on it and be like, yo, heal up, bro. Um, compare that to the Golden Horn Tower. What you might not realize with this one, and this is really cool. So it says here, the value of units produced increases within a system's influence. At first, I was like, oh, okay. So I just want to build it within the radius of my system, right? Wrong. This bad boy stacks with systems. So if you have your Golden Horn Tower and a level five system, it will be producing incredibly fast, much faster than if you just have a level one system. And it's because of that, that I think if you're going for a fast castle strategy, you should avoid going for the Golden Horn Tower and instead go for the system of the first hill, because that's going to mean that you kind of survive that early stage. And you know that stage in, in castle where it's like night versus night, it's really early on, maybe you're diving a TC, that's going to be perfect for the, the system of the first hill, the system of the first hill. Uh, so I, I want to say the system of the first hill, the, the system of the first down. Um, so... I would be recommending that. And of course, we haven't even touched on it yet, but the Cataphract just... Whoa, 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 whoa. Hey, hey, guys. I got cheats on. Um, we haven't touched on the Cataphract yet, uh, but obviously this unit, for anybody who doesn't know, it is the best cavalry unit in the game. And part of the reason that makes it so good... In fact, it's not even part of the reason that makes it so good. It, it has nothing to do with it being so good. It is just a very, very good cavalry unit. But I'll tell you what, we can make it even better with Triumph. And there's no better feeling than going into the Castle Age, being at 80 villages, and knowing I'm making six of these bad boys, and I've got Triumph in the back pocket. So when my enemy comes to push, all I'm going to do is I'm going to hit this button, I'm going to charge in with 
With my cataphracts, I'm going to kill his mangonel, and I'm going to laugh at him as all of my cataphracts heal up. And then behind that, I'm spawning in uh, more Keshiks, by the way. Um, which, of course, we're going to make sure that we upgrade. So we, we get our veterancy as well. An another thing to note, I don't know how to stop this, but when you get veterancy, uh, your Golden Horn Tower will start producing the other type of unit. I, I wish there was a way you could just choose which unit you wanted, uh, like a military school, instead of doing it like this. Because I don't want Gulams. But thanks. Anyway. Anyway, uh, it's been 40 minutes. This has been the Byzantines overexplained. If there was something that I missed, please let me know. I'll be happy to answer it in the comments. If there's any further content you'd like to see on the Byzantines or any ideas that you've got, please let me know. And uh, we'll catch you guys in the next one. Other than that, I'll leave a link in the description to where you can watch this or where you can uh, see the uh, little image that I've been linking or showing you guys, the, um, the Excel spreadsheet. And other than that, we'll catch you guys in the next one. Thank you for watching.